everyone. Welcome to the latest in the eCoast podcast recordings. Um, I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by AJ and Sam from Queen Elizabeth Hospital Kings Lynn. Um, and first of all, I'll let them introduce themselves. So AJ. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, I'm AJ Anderson and I'm the head of staff experience and well-being over at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Sam. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I am Samuel Jude. I am a ward manager on the Feltwell ward, which is a post-acute care ward at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. I'm also uh, part of my role uh, is being the executive lead for East of England for the British Indian Nurses Association. So I'm, I'm involved with uh, pastoral care support for overseas nurses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I've been fortunate to hear AJ and Sam talk about the work that they've been doing both at a ward, a ward level and at kind of trust level around well-being. Um, and I just thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to hear from them about the work they've been doing, um, some of the practical things that they've done, because I think that would be really helpful for others um, as they're thinking about their own well-being development and programme of work. So AJ, if it's all right, I thought I'd start with you. Um, and just kind of, I know that a huge amount has gone on at the trust around well-being. And just a bit from you about kind of where did it all start and why? I know it's probably been going on for some time. So if you looked at that golden triangle of support for work, for well-being, you know, at the top there, you've got strong personal relationships. You've got here in this corner standard of living, which is financial control. And then here you've got achieving um, in life a real sense of purpose. Now, one of the biggest platforms for each of those is the organisation and coming to work day in and day out. And if you want to build upon your own well-being, you need to concentrate on one of those. So as an organisation, we wanted to look at how we could support our staff to have the best day at work and take positive action in uh, looking after their well-being. Now, the Healthcare Institute did a survey, I think it's probably last year or the year before, and a staggering six to nine percent of our well-being is affected by our managers. So, you know, and that's akin to your partner or, or your spouse with doctors and therapists down in the 30s and 40s. So the um, the onus on ensuring that not only are our managers and, and it's great that we've got Sam here today as an advocate for that, um, know the importance of, of well-being and uh, leading for well-being. Um, that really was the, the the cherry on the top of the cake for everything else that we've put in to support our staff through well-being. And I'll, I'll just run through some of those things that we've put in place. So um, pandemic, go back those years. Um, first thing we did was put in um, psychological support for our staff. So our well-being is split through financial, emotional and physical. Um, also within there, there's environmental and occupational, but we, we focus on those three. So we quickly deployed um, a staff, um, a, a psychology support service for our staff. So we have a full-time uh, clinical psychologist, um, a full-time staff counsellor, um, specialising in PTSD and CBT. So we put them in place straight away. So managers can either refer staff members that are struggling with their emotions into that service or you can self-refer in um, on your own terms. Now that's going nowhere, that's embedded. The organisation knew that that was something that was really, really important, not only for advocacy, but staff retention and looking after our staff and and to prevent us losing that wealth of experience. And it's the right thing to do. Um, so that service is there and that is enhanced by our employee assistance programme. We also trained uh, 20 staff to be mental health first aiders. So they're incredibly at taking care of that lower level of uh, the, the triangle of support, psychological support. Um, on top of that, um, and acknowledging that 65% of our workforce are female, we couldn't go um, and miss out on the opportunity to do some work around the menopause. So we trained our um, staff and our managers around uh, menopause awareness. Um, so education sessions, um, we also have invested in a staff menopause clinic that again managers can refer into or staff can refer into themselves um, and that's a twice a month clinic where staff that are 
suffering going through the menopause or even living with or supporting somebody going through the menopause can go and seek advice and support. And that is also supported by menopause champions throughout the organisation. Um, and some of them, I'm pleased to say, are male. So that's fantastic. Um, we have our freedom to speak up guardians in place and our freedom to speak up champions because speaking up is a part of that emotional well-being. Uh, and we provide a psychologically safe space for our staff to be able to speak up and telling us how they feel. And also we draw data on that from the National Staff Survey and the National Quarterly Pulse Surveys. So um, as well as that, for uh, physical health, um, for the last year, we've ran a subsidised gym membership for staff. We have one free exercise class running uh, for our staff with a local gym provider. Uh, we have a whole intranet page that is dedicated for tips on healthy eating. Um, our restaurant at the organisation called The Hub, they promote healthy choices for staff. Um, and also we um, supply staff with various competitions throughout the year. And we've given things away such as yoga kits, um, a day relaxing and having a massage. So we really promote that. And, and, and to win some of those, we also promote a culture of kindness. So we get staff to nominate a colleague who's been a real advocate for well-being and looked after staff and really, really promotes that. Um, we also have something called a wellbeing passport. Now, um, throughout the pandemic and still now, as we're tackling some of those wait lists, staff are asking to be work in different areas. And if you have got a condition, either be it emotional or physical, which means you need some reasonable adjustments or just some real understanding or somebody to just know some of the triggers that might identify that you're not having the best day at work. Having some of those awkward conversations as you're asked to move around uh, and work in different areas can be incredibly uncomfortable. So we bought something in called a wellbeing passport and it looks like your holiday passport. Uh, and within there, we ask staff to complete that with who they are, um, what is it that they need from us to be able to support them, um, if the condition is long term, what reasonable adjustments are in place, what they might need moving forward and how we can best support them. So when we ask staff to move to a different area, they would, for example, go and see Sam and say, hi, Sam, I'm working on your ward for a week, two days. I have a well-being passport. Um, all our managers know what these are about. So Sam would sit down read through the passport and say thank you very much um, thank you for informing me how I can best look after you and then it, the onus would be on Sam to support that staff member and we're confident that Sam's been equipped with all the right information and there's no loss of um, interpretation through what a condition is or what that person needs. Um, so that's some of the things that we have done and um, we also provide um, finance clinics for staff. So recognising that, you know, now more than ever, staff really do need support and guidance in that area. We're not qualified to give out that advice. So we make sure that we've got the right individuals coming into the organisation, recognising that staff don't have the time to go outside of the organisation to, to seek help and support for this. So we have um, a local money advice hub come in, once a fortnight and they hold um, a financial health clinic for staff. You can either book an appointment or, or just pop in and they're there to support with food bank vouchers, help to complete forms with benefits, just to give debt advice and signpost on to other organisations um, if need be. That's amazing. There's so many things across the spectrum that you've been doing to support staff. Have you had much feedback from staff kind of Use, do you see me use this as survey, individual feedback? What's it? What's the feedback been like? Yeah, um, absolutely. That feedback is again, Jen, so so important because we shouldn't always assume that we know what our staff need and everybody's well-being needs. It's fluid. 
it changes. Um, so part of the listening is a real good litmus test to make sure what we're doing, we're putting in the right place at the right time for the right people. So the feedback that we had from a staff survey, uh, we have seen a rise in my manager taking my well-being um, importance. Uh, my well-being is an important factor for my organisation. Uh, we've re received some excellent um, feedback regarding the menopause service for staff. Um, um, we was the first organisation in the UK to put into our job descriptions that we was a menopause friendly employer and we gained accreditation for that from Henpicked. Um, and we do do pulse tests in between just to make sure that we have got the right things in place. So the feedback has been incredibly positive, but it's not just the organisational level work that's receiving that high praise and accolade. Such things as what Sam's been doing um, on his wards around promoting well-being uh, and some of that, um, what we try to encourage as well as staff to get outside, do well-being work, walks, getting out in the fresh air, more team spirited things, you know, uh, building on those relationships, again, supporting that strong personal relationships, part of the well-being triangle um, and achieving life a real sense of purpose. And part of that is the importance that a manager has in achieving that. That's a perfect segue into bringing Sam in to talk about um, the work that he's been doing at ward level. Um, and I guess kind of building on that organisational work, what that means in practice for the staff on the ward and what it means in practice for Sam. So Sam, do you want to tell us a bit about what you've been doing on the ward to support your staff and to, to build in some of that organisational work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, and I will uh, definitely, you know, touch on, you know, what we are doing at the ward level, you know, at in my own ward, uh, and uh, definitely, you know, leading on from uh, what you know AJ has beautifully described as, you know, all the fabulous work, you know, going around, you know, on in QE. Uh, so um, uh, we were part of this culture change, organizational culture change, two or three years, you know, for the last two or three years where, you know, we have started, you know, promoting kindness, wellness and fairness. The, those are our trust values, uh, you know, just kindness, wellness, fairness. And that has sort of uh, really shown positive uh, results in the way staff, you know, um, you know, are dealings with each other, you know, how staff are, you know, um, uh, with each other, they uh, sort of, uh, you know, the demeanor, you know, civility in practice and, you know, how we're having those compassionate conversations. So for me on my ward, I have been on this ward uh, for about two years now uh, and uh, it's been a, a, an incredible journey for me uh, this leadership journey and uh, I'll be honest uh, uh, the well-being work uh, at uh, you know in my ward uh, that was it's all down to the reconditioning games because uh, uh, reconditioning games the national reconditioning games or uh, what we call at the QEH uh, as let's get moving uh, that started off uh, that was kicked off in November 2022 last year so that the main focus was actually uh, you know two branches to it so one was uh, getting patients up and out dressed in their own clothes and preventing deconditioning but I still remember you know of course Nick was there uh, and Dr. Uh, Aurora about you know staff uh, well-being making the workplace a joyful place so I uh, the initial focus was uh, right around you know patients uh, and patient care and how we get that quality and safety up so that is about preventing deconditioning but this next phase was you know started uh, I think early part of January uh, when we had the winter pressures and staff were actually feeling very exhausted you know and uh, with all the uh, pressures and you know even a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, comments on you know how they feel exhaust felt exhausted so I, I thought it's best time now to actually focus on uh, staff you know well-being and and you know looking after their health and well-being so and that was actually complemented by all the great work you know we were all involved you know with Jen, you know with you and the ekis team so uh, again part of uh, that so what uh, we did there was you know uh, initially how how i did it was uh, set up a team of people who were actually in, in interested you know in spending time you know we call them the well-being champions so six of them on the ward um, uh, we wanted them to come together you know and uh, ensure that we are there for the colleagues you know to create that safe space for colleagues uh, because again uh, creating that safe space for colleagues uh, fostering that uh, the working environment where well-being is a priority actually helps uh, 
uh, colleagues actually give better care because when they know that the manager and the uh, the band six, for example, the leaders leadership team are invested in focusing on health and well-being as priority, they tend to you know amplify the performances. What I've seen and that is what I have seen in my sort of uh, four or five months, especially you know with the let's get moving the reconditioning game. So again, it was about uh, engaging with colleagues, collective you know shared uh, shared leadership, so shared purpose, shared vision. Uh, in getting you know this thing right for our patients because uh, again we can only do that by making sure staff are happy uh, we know we should be knowing what makes them smile and you know uh, what brings them joy in the workplace so that has actually worked really well for me thank you um i know you've done lots of really practical things on the ward to improve well-being um i remember you've talked about your trolley your walks um, the gratitude tree. Are you able to talk through some of those very kind of those interventions or that maybe not quite the right word, but the, the practical ways that you've been trying to to just help staff every day? Yeah, so uh, again, thank you, Jen. So uh, absolutely. So what we started off initially was these well-being uh, champions on the ward. So uh, just appointing them sort of made no sense. If we don't uh, equip them with, you know, the right training, the resources, uh, it's not uh, it's no good, basically. So what I did was, you know, they were they share, uh, shared their interest. You know, they are keen to, you know, be in these roles, appointed to these roles. Uh, so I, I did a bit of search and there is so much resources out there. It's just literally all you have to do is tap into them. Uh, AJ and the team have put out so much as well, you know, in terms of uh, uh, places where we can you know, access help and support. So it's just literally streamlining all of that and putting it together at a place, you know, where these people can then go to and tap into that. So uh, I, I got a e-learning for um, a free e-learning uh, from the uh, e-learning for health website for especially for health and well-being champions so they went on to that training they were given a lot of uh, some protected time as well to access that training uh, and you know just um, uh, the main purpose was uh, have those sort of compassionate well-being conversations uh, encourage people to speak up make that psychological safe space uh, and you know make colleagues feel you know that uh, belonging you know they should feel valued and you know feel belonging to the team that sense of belonging to the team so they can thrive so that is what they were the, the actual practical steps you know that we did was uh, around you know having nature walks um, we did the autumn nature walk which actually uh, quite a few of them went and contributed to what we said uh, the virtual tour of the Norfolk coastline because we added on to the steps you know again to uh, you know just count increase account for the let's get moving so that was a um, thing that was nicely subscribed we uh, we did other aspects like mindfulness sessions during our huddles again when it is stressful uh, so just uh, first of all tell us three things of how you feel it can be positive or you know negative but at least if we know we can uh, make sure you know it's a valid recognition of you know those emotions and then we can sort of deal with it that way uh, a lot of sort of public uh, social events uh, you know again with you know our teams you know team night outs uh, bowling the team is going bowling uh, and uh, you know just social events such as those uh, on the ward itself we've had a special spe you know specific trolley for health and well-being so literally things like uh, our health and well-being folder is you know where they can access uh, health and well-being uh, sort of um, apps and uh, uh, pages on you know just mental health well-being uh, financial help uh, we have done uh, and I'm, I'm a mental mental health first aider and a strengths coach as well so utilizing those skills as well you know to help and support them so just signposting them to different activities we have something called as a positivity tree and a memory tree as well so their favorite memory of the time on felt well ward so beautifully you know put there you know in there uh, about what their favorite memory is and it's all the common themes like you know they I uh, really appreciate the equality and diversity on, in the team. We are a very diverse team, so that's very, very much appreciated. Uh, they uh, they love the teamwork. They, you know, all these things. So the, their favorite memory, positivity tree again for open for staff, patients and the families. Uh, again, such great feedback. And literally last week, uh, I we just uh, sort of, you know, 
supported the team again to voice you know any concerns and a lot of good feedback uh, about the difference you know all of this is making uh, there was uh, comments on how the uh, you know the how the individual felt part of the team and it was almost like a non blood family you know they were part of uh, and uh, just want to read it out as well uh, one of the team members said you know they felt so exhausted and burnt out but felt well is such an amazing place to be where emotions are considered valid uh, uh, you know, so thank you for helping out. So just small uh, interventions like these, you know, to uh, make sure, you know, we appreciate, you know, the health and well-being and foster that environment where this is all, uh, uh, you know, valid and appreciated. So again, uh, lots, uh, lots of things is out there. You know, the NHS, uh, the People's Directorate, you know, lots of stuff there for staff well-being. Just, you know, sort of tapping into that. Lots of award specific stuff as well, you know, on the award we are doing. Uh, again, uh, the, the NHS People's Directorate has put a year long training session for health and well-being champions. So I've asked all of my health and well-being champions to join on to that. You know, it's just an hour in two, two or three months. It just comes for an hour uh, session in a long word. So it's just uh, join that and uh, equips them with more sort of uh, knowledge and skills to you know deal all with those all those tough situations. That's brilliant. It's amazing how you've used both the trust resources and the NHS wide resources and kind of pulled them together to to really create this great repository for your staff. Um, just bringing AJ back in, um, kind of just a couple of very quick questions, one about training and then what what's next. So in terms of training for kind of well-being across the trust, you've got the mental health first aid training you talked about. Is there anything else? And then what's the next big thing for it or the next thing for well-being? So we've been asking our managers to attend um, the um, having safe and effective wellbeing conversation uh, for managers training that NHS England have put on to equip them with the skills um, to have some of those often quite sensitive uh, conversations. Um, so again, myself um, as head of staff experience and our OD team are there to help managers perhaps that might need some coaching or mentoring within that area. Um, I've recently undertaken the um, leading for wellbeing facilitator training. So we're going to be running workshops for our leaders to understand uh, one, the importance of their own wellbeing and how having good emotional and physical health is just as important for the staff members that they lead as it is for themselves. So we really are taking uh, wellbeing very seriously and we're investing in um, that area, not only just in our managers, but in the things we put in place, because it's not about a free yoga session. It, it's not about have a, a, um, a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and as well done. You know, that's not that's get, getting nowhere near what our staff needs. What they need is a compassionate, caring manager. Um, they need um, values that support a well-being culture. And as leaders, uh, we need to empower our leaders to be vulnerable. And, you know, if I'm having a bad day, or I'm, if I'm not having a particularly good day or I'm feeling a bit sensitive, I'm going to share that. And we should, you know, we shouldn't look down on people and say, you know, that person's not resilient. They absolutely are. We need to be leading in the right way and advocating. So real, really building a well-being culture. Amazing. Um, just a very quick last question to you both. Um, kind of just in a couple of sentences, top tips for anybody else kind of developing their well-being programme. AJ from a kind of trust perspective and Sam from a ward perspective. Um, yeah, so first you need the the uh, buy in from the top. So right from the very top, it needs a top down message. So um, make sure that um, your your executive team, you've got a CEO that's a real advocate and a sponsor for it and their voice is powerful and frequent um, that the board are holding you account for delivering that as well. Um, and also that you really understand what is needed within your own organisation, because what's needed in my trust, for example, might be very, very different that's needed in another trust. So try not to take from other areas what you think your trust need. Listen to what your staff have to say. Keep checking in with them regularly and then tailor your programme to suit their needs, not what's going on elsewhere. 
Brilliant. The theme of listening comes up all the way Absolutely. through. Thank you. Um, Sam, just a very quick last couple of tips from you about any other ward managers or people kind of doing the work that you're doing. What would you say to them? Again, for me, it will be uh, really about, you know, connecting, you know, with your teams, you know, engaging them, uh, valuing their feedback, you know, and and making sure this is th this this is a core focus as well. Staff well-being is a core priority for, you know, the team uh, and, and you actually invest in it. It's about positive risk taking as well, because again, all through, you know, in, in, in all the wards at QBS, there hasn't been such thing as well-being champions, but it's a bit of risk taking to see, uh, you know, let us, you know, have them appointed and uh, invest in them to see what the results. And I'm actually seeing results because uh, better staff engagement um, morale has massively improved um, minimal to zero to minimal incidents on the ward, you know, in terms of patient care, patient safety, uh, retention is there, you know, very less sort of turnover uh, and, and sickness rates have come down. Again, it's too early to tell. It's just been three or four months, but I, I, I can almost assume and for, you know, foresight, you know, that, you know, this is definitely going to help me and help the team, you know, help us in, in uh, getting, you know, there, you know, in terms of where we have to be. And again, this is sharing because uh, it's all out there, you know, everything, nothing, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Everything is out there. It's just literally widening the, you know, your lens a bit and tapping into those uh, local uh, trust based, regional, national resources and just sort of putting it together. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you so much, both. Um, and I think the testament, hearing your staff feedback, Sam, was lovely to hear the kind of how they feel about being on the ward. Um, so can I formally end and say a massive thank you to AJ and Sam for their time, for sharing their experience, the work that they're doing. Um, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you and um, I look forward to seeing what comes next and, and building on the really good work. Um, so on behalf of Ekis and the team, thank you very much for your time and um, thank you for joining us on the podcast. <laughs>